things for Mega Gen in South Africa. Wow, nice. Thank you, Denise. <laughs> she's, she's writing that she's blushing. Yeah, yeah, yeah she can hear us. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I think we are able to start because it's already at 7 <clears throat> p.m. So, good evening, everyone, once again. This is Rolandes from Megagen, and thanks for taking the time to join our Megagen webinar once again. Today, we're delighted to have Dr. Howard Gluckman as our guest speaker with the topic, Creating Ideal Soft Tissue Around Implants. Dr. Gluckman was an early adopter uh, of Enrich Implant and one of our teachers with the socket shield technique. Finally, developing the partial extraction therapy kit with us to make the technique more predictable for all. He is an excellent surgeon who cares about his patient's outcomes and above all, a generous teacher and mentor to all who came in his path. His tireless efforts to keep us all learning during the COVID outbreak have given everyone an opportunity to get to know him better. It is a pleasure and really a big honor to have uh, to and also to welcome him to this platform. So as this event is live, we're going to collect all of your questions during the, his presentation. And at the end of the session, Dr. Howard Gluckman will, will answer all of, all of, all of your questions uh, as well. So Dr. Dr. Gluckman, let me hand you over and the stage is yours. Thanks so much, Dimitri. Thank you so much, everybody. <clears throat> Thank you for the kind introduction. And uh, um, it's always a, a pleasure to be here with, uh, with you guys. Um, you know, to be, uh, to be part of uh, Megagen. I've been with Megagen for many, many years. They are still the premier brand and, and my favorite and most favorite implant, uh, despite the fact that I use, that I use different brands. Um, and it's always a pleasure to be here with the Menek group um, <clears throat> and to be with Megajet. They are my family and uh, I love them dearly. So it's a pleasure to be here with you. It's a pleasure to be with everybody here from all around the world. Thank you so much for taking time out of your schedules uh, to, to be with us tonight. Uh, some of you, it might be quite late. Some of you, it might be early, but welcome. And obviously a special welcome to my fellow South Africans and fellow Africans who are who are here with us tonight. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here with you. What I'm going to share with you is really about soft tissue, <clears throat> um, developing soft tissue around implants and utilizing different techniques. And uh, I met uh, in, the, in the discussion earlier, spoke about the two words that I love, predictability, reproducibility. Key words that are absolutely um, essential in everything that we do. So um, <clears throat> the, key, the, key fact, the key factor here is how do we create um, our, our ideal soft tissue? How do we make sure? And what are the soft tissue parameters that you require for getting perfect soft tissue? So we're gonna look at a number of factors tonight. We're gonna look at soft tissue thickness. We're gonna look at the timing of soft tissue surgery. We're gonna look at whether soft tissue is essential. And we're going to look at how much attached gingiva is really necessary. And then most importantly, I'm going to talk a couple about a predictable techniques that are predictable in my hands. Now, the one thing I want you to understand, it's with everything that anybody lectures on, is that there are a multitude of different techniques that you can employ. The techniques that I'm going to show you are techniques that I've mastered, that I have grown up with and which work for me in the predictable and reproducible arena. And I think anything that you do has to have the same, the same, type, of, uh, the same type of result. So if you are doing a technique that you're failing at more than you're succeeding at, try something else, find another one. And, and you might find that there's a technique that I show you that doesn't work in your hands. Find something else. There are many, many brilliant surgeons around the world that will help you develop the techniques that you need in order to get to where you want to go. The key factor that you have to understand is that bone and soft tissue are symbiotic. They work very, very closely together and they're very, very important together. In other words, you have to have good bone in order to have good soft tissue. You have to have good soft tissue in order to have good bone. And I think the data is now becoming stronger and stronger for us to understand the interrelationship between the two and how important those factors are between the two. When we look at soft tissue, <clears throat> soft tissue uh, is important in health. 
Soft tissue is important in aesthetics. Soft tissue is important in function. And they all kind of co-interrelate. So soft tissue is the key factor and it's really something critically important. And when we go to uh, the key factor, what is aesthetics? From uh, Stephen Chu and Dennis Tarnow's article, the patient today requires a natural looking tooth and gingival architecture in the aesthetic zone. So the soft tissue really is what makes your case. You can have beautiful bone and sometimes you can have terrible bone. But if your soft tissue is perfect, if your soft tissue is, is ideal, then you're going to have the ideal aesthetic result. Mauro Frodiani in his book, and I've quoted this in many, and I use this uh, quote often in my pet lectures, but Frodiani uh, says in his book that it doesn't matter how good a crown you put in there, if the emergence profile and the pink aesthetic score and the, and the pink profile is not perfect, whether the crown has to have the perfect the hue, texture, chroma, everything. If it's not right, if the pink is not right, the crown is a failure. And I think that's the truth. And I think many of you have put in a crown thinking, oh, what a fantastic result. But when the patient looks at it and the papilla's wrong or the gingival uh, lines are wrong, etc., they're like, mm, they're not so happy with the result. And, and <clears throat> from your side, uh, it's, it's a bit of a failure and disaster. The aesthetic result from Thomas Hunza and Faud Puri, the aesthetic result of an implant treatment depends on the contours surrounding the soft tissue, uh, so of the surrounding soft tissue. So soft tissue is really what creates the beauty of, uh, of everything that we do. So when we look at the timing of soft tissue, <clears throat> let's look at the data that's been published by, uh, by Lynn. And basically what they did is they did a systematic review with the meta-analysis and, and the essence was they wanted to find out how important is the timing in other words when should i do my soft tissue surgery should i do my soft tissue surgery at the beginning should i do my soft tissue surgery at the end <clears throat> what is the right time and is there a right time and they measured uh, keratinized tissue width which is ktw they measured stt which is soft uh, soft tissue uh, thickness and what they found was is that soft tissue augmentation really makes no difference whether you do it at first stage or whether you do it at second stage. So that being said, what do I prefer? I always prefer to have another bite of the theory. So I tend to leave my soft tissue for the last procedure. I know a lot of people like to do soft tissue grafting first. And the rationale for doing soft tissue grafting first generally is because they want to develop the site and have more soft tissue to have more closure. That particular mindset and thinking is something I disagree with totally for the pure reason that when you introduce soft tissue into a, a site where you're going to do bone grafting, you are introducing scar tissue. And scar tissue is not very vascular, so you want the most vascular tissue to be able to close. And if your flap's not closing properly, it's because you haven't managed the flap properly, not because you don't have enough soft tissue. So that makes no difference to me. So <clears throat> essentially, I like to do my surgery right at the end, and you'll see a lot of the cases are done at exposure, because what happens is you never know how the bone graft's gonna work and how everything, sometimes you have enough tissue with the bone graft alone, sometimes you don't, but it gives you the opportunity just to make the corrections of soft tissue recession on adjacent teeth, maybe some papilla, et cetera, et cetera. So it's certainly something we wanna look at. The next question that we wanna look at is how thick should the soft tissue be? And uh, this, uh, in 2015, this systematic review basically concluded that there was no evidence that the soft tissue thickness made any difference at all. Um, and that was interesting because what happened by the next year, we could see here this meta-analysis from uh, um, Fernando uh, Delamo uh, from Homley Wang's group. They showed just one year later, they showed that the current study demonstrates that implants placed in initially thicker peri-implant soft tissue had to have much less marginal bone loss. So in other words, the more bone that you have, I mean, sorry, the thicker the soft tissue you have, the better it is. So this would indicate quite the opposite of what I was saying, because it's saying now that if you have a thicker tissue, you're gonna have much more stable bone, you're gonna get more, more, more marginal bone loss. So obviously all of this information comes mostly from Thomas Linkovicius's work. They did a lot of work where they showed that where your mucosal tissue is uh, greater than or less than three millimeters, you've got far less marginal bone loss and marginal changes once you fitted your abutment. And uh, they showed that with medium and thin tissue biotypes, 
that you get crestal bone loss. And Thomas Linkovicius is doing a lot of work now. His zero bone loss concept, a beautiful book that he writes uh, for anyone who wants to, to get his stuff. But basically what he shows is if you have a look on the left-hand side, you can see with thick bone, you can see that uh, around this area, I'm just going to draw on here. You can see, you can see on this, you can see on this area, you can see that there's very little bone loss in the area. Whereas when you look at the, at the next line, you can see there that when there's uh, less bone, you can see now you start to get much more bone loss around the implant. Okay, because of the thickness. So this, the speculation was it's because of the thickness. And when you have very, very thin bone, uh, thin soft tissue in this one, which doesn't really make much sense because here you can see where the soft tissue is. The soft tissue's pretty much at that line, which kind of looks the same as the others. So one has to question whether maybe the, the socket here was a little bit less, uh, less um, developed uh, than, than others. The other article that they showed, they showed uh, again in 2013, quite categorically that uh, the thicker the soft tissue that you have, the more, uh, the less bone, marginal bone loss, and you can see the marginal bone loss that, that takes place once you fit the abutment, as opposed to the thicker, to the thicker, to the thicker results. Here you can see the bone levels that are absolutely stable when you're dealing with this type of situation. So I think there's no doubt that uh, in this day and age with, uh, um, there's, uh, there's uh, Berglund, there's there's a lot of different groups that are now working with the same concept. And I think the key factor now is that we need to know that tissue is an issue. We need to develop our tissue to at least around three millimeters, both vertically and horizontally, to make sure that we get both stability of the soft tissue over time, as well as the fact that we give and create stability for our bone over that period of time. So it's a key factor. The other thing that we have to know about tissue thickness is, is that when you have tissue that is too thin, you tend to get shine through either of your zirconia or of your metal. And from this publication, we know that when you have less than two millimeters of tissue thickness, okay, when it's less than two millimeters, what happens is it tends to shine through. And if you have a look at this case of mine, you can see exactly that kind of scenario where I failed to build the soft tissue enough. The collapse of the tissue, as we know from loss of bundle bone when you do the extract, you can see that number one, we've got recession. Number two, we've got buccopalatal collapse. And I want you to just bear in mind this, uh, this, uh, this specific case because I'm going to take you back and show you how I managed this case a little bit later using a specific technique and why we chose this technique versus the other techniques. So let's look at soft tissue enhancements. And really the problem with soft tissue and certainly dealing with single teeth now, not with multiple teeth, although multiple teeth, our problems become bigger and bigger, is gingival recession and buccopalatal collapse. Those are the two major issues that we have to play with, whether they happen over time or whether they happen right from the start. So the key factor is understanding that this is a problem and this is going to happen because of the loss of bone as you extract your teeth. We need to understand that we need to utilize different soft tissue thickening techniques right from the beginning so that we can uh, make sure that we know that uh, how, thing, how, thing, how things are, 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 are working. So what I, want you to, what I want to do is I want to go through now different, uh, different techniques. And the one technique I think that really made a huge difference for me, and now it comes down to, again, reproducibility and what techniques really work. And this was a, a major publication that I read in as early as 2011, and Joseph Kahn has done some great work as well on this whole technique. But um, Uli Grunder, who's one of the all-time greats of implantology, showed us that when you took a connective tissue graft, so when you did an immediate implant, and you did a connective tissue graft at the same time as doing an implant, you actually gained around 0.34 millimeters of tissue. And the great thing about that is that he showed as well, they did a non-grafted group and they actually showed that they lost tissue. So it's interesting because there are a lot of people on Facebook these days that are talking about, uh, talking about non-grafting and uh, I'll be talking to Stephen Chu about socket shield versus, uh, versus dual zone therapy. And um, um, a lot of people are just showing wonderful cases and, and, and how stable these cases are. The problem for me is that this doesn't happen in my, in my results. Most of my results, when I don't use soft tissue, or if I don't use a socket shield, I get collapse to some degree. 
Um, certainly there are certain cases that don't, but those are the exception in my hands, not the rule. And I think most people would agree with these that we need to do something. So this is really a technique that really works uh, su superb, superbly well. And I'm just going to just switch this a little softer. So here you can see a very classic pouch technique that we utilize, um, taking a piece of tissue from the palate. Um, some people like to use synthetic uh, materials. I don't like synthetic materials. I like autogenous or to autologous material because I find it gives us, it actually expands. And this tissue tends to expand, as you'll see. And the great thing about this technique is when I started out with this technique, the minute I took this technique, Immediately on taking this technique, I actually had success with it. Literally the first time, the first 10 times I had techniques, I had the odd failure every now and again. But really this technique is an incredibly successful, incredibly reproducible technique. And one of the techniques that we teach most often at our academy, because it is really something that anyone who's doing implants, doing immediate implants or anything like that needs to understand how to utilize this. You can see with this technique that uh, you can actually uh, coronal reposition the flap, as you can see, um, utilizing uh, sling sutures in this. And you can see how this technique looks, and you can see here, um, you can see the expansion. You can see how we've maintained the tissue, and you can see how beautiful we've now created three and a half tissue, three and a half millimeters of tissue. And in most cases, barring a very thin gingival morphotype, you will get a very, very successful result using this technique. I have certainly found that with thin gingival morphotypes, I'm certainly not as successful utilizing this. And often I find that even after doing connective tissue grafts with thin gingival morphotypes, I tend to still get the collapse and the shrinkage. And here you can see the same result, the same case five years later, you can see the stability of the tissue over time. So what's happened now is you've got collapse of the sockets, but the, the overbuild that we created when we were doing the when we were actually doing the soft tissue has allowed us to maintain that stability of soft tissue over time. So this is really one of the, one of the fundamental basic implantology techniques we need to learn uh, as beginners and when we do that. Here's another, exactly the same sort of thing. This is now called the surgical veneer graft. This is a, a technique uh, developed uh, by um, Andrea um, and uh, Antonio Agonini, the Agonini brothers from Italy, from uh, Modena and Maurice Salama from Team Atlanta and Dental XP. And basically this is dual zone therapy with connective tissue graft, really. So they, they've just taken two techniques, they've merged them uh, to create it. And we've used this technique, we've also used the water lays to do a closed crown lengthening on this, on this, uh, on this case to get the teeth a little bit uh, better into the aesthetic that we want to. You can see the final result with this case is absolutely amazing. So. You can see it's just it's a technique that really works very very well. You can see the the bone that's left in the in the in the socket from the dual zone therapy, a classic scenario. We try and take this bone out because often what happens over time, if left, these these chips can sometimes become infected, and you get a, a, a draining sinus forming over time. So it's important that we check that. But you can see the beautiful result that we get here with this case, the beautiful emergence profile. But the interesting thing about this is the reason I show you this case is because if you look at the buckle, you can see absolutely, if, if you look at the case, you can see perfect implant, perfect placement, beautiful bone around the implant. Everything that we've got is absolutely stunning. But the key factor here is that um, if you look at the post-op CVCT, I've got no bone. And I tell you this because I show you this because this is a very, very important thing. Having soft tissue, and having good soft tissue on a single tooth does not necessarily mean you're going to have bone there. And you can see, and Zucchelli quite categorically states that when you have, you don't need uh, bone for soft tissue. You just need, uh, you just need, um, you just need uh, soft tissue to give you good aesthetics. But the problem with this is the choice of, of implant size here for me, I think was incorrect. I should have possibly gone for a, a mini implant, a three millimeter implant. I possibly should have done a, uh, a delayed approach here, but I have got a good result. And if I showed you just the periapical, you would say to me, Howard, wonderful result, well done, congratulations, everything's stunning. So I just want you to be aware that uh, CBCT is very important to show success of bone over the buckle. So yes, although this is a successful case aesthetically, the question is whether it will be successful long-term from a peri-implantitis point of view and from a stability. 
And should I lose an implant next door? In other words, should the tooth next door fail, the potential for a, uh, for a problem are quite high. So let's look at exposure. Let's look at the way we do exposures and things like that. What is the, the classic type of technique? And I think for most people, the technique that they utilize when they're doing a single tooth exposure is the classic technique like this, the papilla saving incision. And I did this many, many years ago. You can see even before I started using Megagen. And the classic scenario, you apically reposition, you put your crown in, you do whatever you want to do. But the problem with this technique always, and you can see the classic type of situation, even though we've got a nice band of attached gingiva, we've recreated, we've brought the... Uh, We've brought the mucogingival junction back to where it is. But if you have a look at both of these areas, it really doesn't look great. And everyone says, hold on, don't worry. Everything's going to be fine. Everything's it's going to settle down. It's just, it's going to develop. It's going to mature over time. Well, 10 years later, it's still not brilliant. It still looks terrible. And I still look at this case and I'm not happy with the aesthetic result of the soft tissue. So these are problems that I started to have and I started to see and I really didn't like the results of that, of, the, of what we were getting and the scarring uh, or, or Dennis Tarnow doesn't call it scarring, he calls it just, uh, just uh, um, um, incision lines, etc. but call it what you want. The aesthetics of that for me were never, never that great. So in 2008, we started with a new technique and this was published in uh, 2017 or 2018, I can't remember myself and Maurice Salama. And this was a technique that I developed um, well back in 2008 to start to deal with the whole process of what we're doing. And the aesthetic tunnel exposure really was a technique that limits the scarring, was able to treat recession of adjacent teeth, allowed us to coronally reposition the gingival margin and helped prevent clefts forming on adjacent teeth. And I'm sure most of you will find, and I'm gonna show you a little bit later, that a lot of times when you don't do your technique right, you end up with clefts on your adjacent teeth, which either exposes the crown, if you have a crown, or if it causes a problem with the, with this, the aesthetics on the adjacent teeth. And the other thing is that a lot of times when we do just a single pouch, when we just create a pouch, I'm sure most of you had the experience that when you take a piece of tissue and you just create a pouch, it's almost impossible to put that piece of tissue into the, uh, into the, uh, into the pouch because sometimes it's too big and you end up having to cut it down or you, you tear the papilla, real problem. So the aesthetic tunnel approach, what it does is really gives us the ability to um, work with a much wider pouch. And the wider the pouch, the easier it is for you to coronally reposition. The easier it is for you to put soft tissue into the pouch because there's much more space for you to achieve it. So if we look at this patient who had a motor vehicle accident and had this massive cleft, we did some, some bone grafting, some curry bone grafting, and this is the bone as it looks four months later, placing our Megagen uh, a four millimeter implant in the correct three-dimensional position. And when the patient comes back, you can see even after all the bone grafting that I've done, after all the beautiful bone that you see in this case and the beautiful lines that I've got, you can still see that in the area where I need it most, the transition zone, I'm still wanting, I'm still lacking the, the, the soft tissue in the area that I need it. And that's why I like at this sort of stage to do my, 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 my soft tissue grafting at this stage because it gives me the chance now to do the final bit of contouring. And you can see the collapse of the tissue in that. So how do we manage this kind of thing? And what are the indications for this aesthetic tunnel approach? How do we deal with this eight approach? And essentially what we need here is we need to have at least eight to nine millimeters uh, mesiodistally. It's absolutely critical. And the reason why we need eight to nine millimeters is because our initial incision is going to be this little, what we call reverse peninsula incision. So this is a, just a small little flap. And, um, um, and what we're going to do is we're going to use that small little piece of tissue as well, just to do a little infold. And that little infold sometimes is all that's, necessary for us to actually get a decent, uh, a decent thickness of the tissue. But in this case, we actually need that plus a piece of connective tissue. We need to leave space because we are not going to cut through our papilla. We are going to leave the papilla intact. And that's very, very important because it helps us develop the papillae right from the start and very, very crucial. So if we take a look 
at the limitations of this is where we have less than eight to nine millimeters, we actually cannot do this technique. We have to uh, go other techniques and I'll show you what we're going to do in the other, in the other scenarios. So as you can see here in this scenario, you can see we've created, we've done a full thickness, uh, small, small little incision, and that's over the top of the implant. So the implant is sitting pretty much in that position and allowing us, let me just draw that in a, in a, in a color that you can see a little bit better. And that's going to allow us, and that's Megagen Blue for you. And now it's going to allow us to get access to that. I'm going to show you a video. Then we create a pouch that goes from mesial line angle to distal line angle of the teeth on either side. And we extend that with sharp or blunt dissection at least one centimeter up into the vestibule. And that's very, very important because by releasing it by that one centimeter into the vestibule, it's going to allow you to mobilize that flap Coroli reposition, as well as make space for you to place your piece of connective tissue. You can see what we've done now. We've sutured the connective tissue with one suture over there and the second suture over there. So we've actually put it in and we've stretched it into position. And stretching soft tissue is always critically important because if we only suture soft tissue with one suture, it tends to collapse because the elastin fibers constrict and it tends to collapse on itself and we get a lot of resorption of that kind of situation. You can see here with a, we've done a little bit of laser phrenectomy and we've now done some um, uh, through, the, through the occlusion uh, sutures described by Otto Zur and Marcus Herzler and we've pulled the whole area coronally so that now we can utilize the provisional crown and we always use a provisional crown when we're working in the aesthetic zone. We never ever ever go straight to a final crown when we are doing these sort of things. So it's always a provisional so that we can develop the soft tissue contours. And here you can see all the, different, all the different things that we have in that scenario. And here you can see just a little bit of a video how we actually do this technique. So here we're gonna go full thickness. We create that little bit of an area. We raise that little bit of a pouch and we get access to our implant. And obviously it's important that you know where your implant is. We take the healing cap out testing uh, the ISQ levels, making sure that we've got integration. And now we just de-epithelialize that small little piece of tissue using a very sharp blade. So we use a new blade with this to make sure that we can de-epithelialize. And that piece of tissue just gets tucked under. But now what I'm doing is I'm creating the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the, uh, the rest of the flap. And I'm just kind of going either side, creating the pouch, and now with sharp dissection, just moving into that area and dissecting. I'm just gonna go a little bit faster here because we don't have that much time tonight. And again, creating with blunt dissection, a split thickness flap that extends all the way to the top. And what we're doing is we're extending as much as we can so that we can start get mobility. So now you can see is as I'm starting to move it, now I'm starting to get mobility of the flap and I'm making sure that everything's joined from the left-hand side, the right-hand side. I've got junction from everywhere to make sure that the whole thing is nice and mobile. We measure our piece of tissue. We harvest our piece of tissue. I'm going to go through that quickly because it's not important. We're using a 6-0 suture. Now we put our tissue in. We catch our tissue using a corn pliers. And we always go back and we go back backwards, never going forwards. And again, we catch the other side of the tissue. So we're not doing anything yet until such time as we've got our sutures in place. And once our sutures are in place, then what happens is we pull the piece of tissue into place and it fl flows into place very, very simply and very, very easily. And now I can pull that piece of tissue tight on both sides and I can tuck my last piece of tissue into place. So a very, very nice way to do it. We suture everything closed using, uh, using uh, these techniques. We then use the uh, scan bodies. We do digital dentistry, creating a, uh, creating a crown for the patient. We have a crown made, and then we fit the crown as soon as possible. Um, this is just a temporary denture. And there you can see, once the crown has been made, we put the crown into position. And that allows us now to start to develop our tissue. And you can see the, it allows the, the papilla to fill in really, really nicely in those kind of areas. 
So really a great technique. And for anyone who wants the publication, send me an email or I'll send it to Megagen, they'll have it. Where I don't have enough tissue, what I do is I usually use the modified Palachi technique. So again, I don't use the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the um, papilla saving incision. We, we use here a, an incision here, which is a modification of Palachi. So instead of doing a single sausage technique, we do a double sausage from the midline and we take both pieces and we swing them around. As you'll see uh, from here, you can see how we create and we swing them around so that we can kind of fill up the papilla in both the areas. Now this works very, very well, but I want you to notice, you can see on, on here, you can see if we leave and if we don't open up from here to here, you can see what happens with the cleft formation on the adjacent teeth. And it's very, very important that you extend your flap, whether you do this technique, whatever technique you do, it's one thing if you walk away with only one thing today, learn that technique, is make your incisions further because that allows this whole flap to sit very passively against the tooth over there without forming those clefts that one normally gets in those type of situations. So you can see here with that, how we suture that into place. We suture our graft into place, getting everything nice. And now we start to suture, taking the base, very, very deep in the base. And now we're coming over and we're catching from the epithelium. So we're doing now a figure of eight suture. And now we catch our very, very small piece of tissue. We catch our small little tissue across there. And we're using very fine needles. We're using 6-0 suture. You can use a 7-0 as well. And these are really 11 or 13 millimeter needles. And the smaller the needle and the smaller the thread, the better, because we're dealing with very small pieces of tissue. So it's very, very important that we, that we utilize these small, that the, these small needles so we don't damage the tissue too much. And I think for anyone you've had the opportunity to watch Marcus Herzl and go and do his courses because he's really a master at teaching these soft tissue techniques and, and this kind of stuff, especially working in the suturing techniques that that we do. It's certainly where I learned a lot of my skill and my, uh, my techniques from. So here you can see just doing, just cutting that. And um, again, just showing the, the technique of the suturing, going through, this shows it a little bit more clearly, going through the base, very, very deep in the base, coming around the outside, going through the buckle, going through the palate, the, the palatal, coming through. So this is the figure eight suture that we were talking about, catching our small piece shoe, And now what we're doing is uh, the small piece of tissue, we are now going back and coming in to where we want to pull that piece of tissue. So we're now going from connective tissue through to epithelium again. And then we just help by pulling that, it helps to tuck that piece of tissue into place. And you can see how beautifully now we actually get to develop the papillae in this case. And you can see how beautifully we manage to achieve the papillae. And now with the provisional in place, you can see how nicely we can now start to develop and build on that soft tissue, add on to that tissue to get it to the right position so that by the time we get to do the final, you've actually got the right procedure. The other technique that I use a hell of a lot is the infold technique. And the reason why we use this is often the nice thing about this is you don't need to go and get tissue from somewhere else. And often when patients are very scared of taking tissue from the palate, we'll use the infold technique. It's certainly not my first choice of technique. I would rather do a connective tissue graft, but it does work very, very nicely in most cases. And what you can see is we make a split thickness flap with this, and we kind of reduce it on the palatal side, and we then harvest, and you can see this whole piece of tissue here that we're now going to take, and we are going to um, take that piece of tissue, and we're gonna fold that into the buckle. So you can see here again, and you can see very clearly the fact that I'm mobilizing my tissue all the way means that those small little clefts that normally occur are not gonna occur. And I'm sure most of you have found that it's very difficult for you to put the tissue back and those clefts occur and they're very frustrating because it ruins the whole final result. And you can see on the final, on the far right hand side, how beautiful the soft tissue profile. And if I show you this case, you can see this is a case where we did palatal bone blocks and in the initial phase. And you can see there, then we placed a mini implant in this case, and we went on 
to uh, folding, doing an infold technique, and you can see how much tissue we create with this. So we really create a lot of tissue, which enables us when replacing the provisional, and this is just a provisional crown, allows us to actually start to modify. This patient, unfortunately, didn't brush her teeth too well. Um, and uh, here you can see at the, fin at the final stages, still with the same provisional that we put in, you can see with some crown lengthening just to get the zenith right of the adjacent teeth. And you can see the beautiful result that we achieve uh, with the emergence of this using, the, uh, using this technique. So attached gingiva is really one of the most important things that we, can, that we can talk about in developing it. And this is where I want to spend most of the time today. And we know that when we look at the World Workshop, they, they state quite categorically that when they said what factors are associated with the recession of peri mucosa, and one of them was lack of keratinized tissue. And there's no doubt that anyone who sees a case that doesn't have any keratinized tissue, the risk of having a problem with recession is very, very high. The second question, does the presence or absence of keratinized mucosa play a role in long-term peri implant maintenance of health? They show that it's not equivocal. In other words, it's not really being shown to, 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 to be that much of an, of an issue. But the one article uh, by, by Adibrad, um, by this group, they showed um, from that when you had greater than two millimeters of uh, associated tissue, you had far less mucosal recession, you had uh, periodontal attachment, you had far more periodontal attachment loss when you had less than two millimeters. And certainly the absence of keratinized mucosa around implants supporting overdentures was associated with higher plaque accumulation, gingival inflammation and bleeding. And I think everyone will agree that you'll see these cases, most of these cases where you don't have enough attached gingiva end up with this problem. One of my favorite articles by Canulo uh, from Botticelli, or Botticelli and Cavani's group they showed that the lack of sufficient height of keratinized mucosa, as well as bone regenerative procedures. So in other words, if you didn't develop your bone and you didn't develop your soft tissue well enough, the, re the prevalence of peri-implantitis went up. And that comes down to the whole fact of what Zucchini says about you don't need bone when you need aesthetics. That's true. You can just have soft tissue. But the problem is, is that the risk of peri-implantitis is, is higher. So we need to develop both our tissues adequately to make sure that we get the right result. The case on the left is my case where I didn't develop the, the, the tissue well enough and we got this recession over time. And you can see the kind of angry perimucositis, perimucositis with suppuration. And you look on the right side, yes, that was referred to me for treatment, where absolutely zero attached gingiva, peri-implantitis and pus and suppuration coming out of the socket. So, these are really the issues. And there are two critical uh, techniques that I'm going to spend the rest of this lecture talking about. The one is the apically repositioned flap, which is the most important. And the second one is the uh, vestibuloplasty with free gingival grafting. And if we look at this uh, study by Giovanni Bruschi uh, and Crespi, you'll notice that when they did an apically repositioned flap, what's absolutely phenomenal is they showed that you get around 7.26 millimeters of attached gingiva. Now, this is exactly what I found, and this is what's amazing. As I said to you, reproducibility, predictability. In other words, I took this article, I tried their technique, and the results that I achieved using their technique was exactly the same as they reported. So for me, whether this is a case report, it doesn't matter what it is, it doesn't matter whether it's prospective, retrospective, the fact of the matter is when I tried it, I succeeded. And that, to me, often means more than a study that has a 10-year follow-up or things like that. that that I try and I fail at. Okay, <clears throat> there's something for me that's wrong with the procedure. So if we look at implant placement or implant exposure, okay, when we look at either of those, when I'm placing the implant or when I'm gonna expose the implant, most often we do just a very simple, minimally invasive, either a punch or something like that. You can see we've got tissue loss over here and most people will make a mid-crestal incision a lot of people will do a papilla saving incision, do a little bit of soft tissue grafting into there, etc. cetera. Um, the problem with that technique, as I showed you before, is that you don't really develop the tissue and you end up with scarring. So it's, it's not really a great technique for developing the band of attached gingiva that you want. And more often than not, we end up with a situation like this one. And this, these are all my cases. They're nobody else's cases. These are cases that I didn't develop well enough. And if we look at the tissue that we've got there, what do we actually have? 
we actually have a situation whereby we have attached ginger, we have a keratinized mucosa, but we don't have attached gingiva. And I think that's the key. Whereas if we look at this kind of situation, you can see the difference here where we have a wonderful keratinized mucosa. And I take you to this article, which I found online. And this is, a, this is really the minimally invasive type of style that we see these days where people hitting the target with careful treatment planning and optimal outcomes. And this is just crazy because they've taken all the attached ginger away. There's no attention to detail. And the, the nice thing about this is it's very nice for patients in the short term. But in the long term, the risk that's going to, that's that of periimplantitis, the risk of perimucositis is very, very high. So we need to develop our tissues so that we create a nice thick band of attached gingiva on the outside. So the apically repositioned flap, here you can see the type of situation where we use a very, very thin uh, piece. Uh, we do a split thickness flap and we haven't even exposed the implants. There are three implants still sitting under that connective tissue. You can see it's a very, very thin piece of tissue. I'm going to show you a little video. And now we don't try and join our tissue back. We don't try and attach our tissue here. We actually suture our tissue all the way on the line on the outside there. And by doing that, we recreate the attached gingiva that's firmly attached to bone. And these are key factors. And I urge you to join me. Either come to South Africa, join us at our academy. I urge you to, uh, to wherever I go, we do a lot of work with Megagen and the Minic groups. Wherever we are, we do soft tissue courses. Come and join one of our courses where we teach this technique uh, in the hands-on because it's a very, very important technique. And you can see how much tissue that we've gained. And the beautiful thing about this is, number one, you don't have a tissue color change like you do with a free gingival graft. And the second thing with this technique is the tissue tends to expand. And all the tissue that you have in the middle here all of this regrows and comes back to the tissue where it was before. So here you can see the expansion and you really, you end up with a beautiful band of attached gingiva around the outside. And if we look at this, this case, you can see exactly the same sort of thing that we've created in this area over there. These are, these are partial, that is a, that is a Pontic shield. This is a socket shield. This is a root submergence technique. So you can see different pet techniques. But you can see that in this area with a apically repositioned flap and GBR, we can get as good a result, a lot more work than doing the other techniques, but really, really works well. And the nice thing about it is that you can see that the emergence profile of your cases is much, much better because of the fact that you've really spent the time developing your tissue. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take you quickly through this case. And I'm not going to spend too much time because we're coming on to, on to, uh, on to uh, uh, we're going through the time quite quickly. So here, here you can see this sort of situation. You can see the classic scenario. And most people here would just do a punch. But the problem is, is if you do a punch, you don't really develop the tissue as well as one wants. And you can see all the attached gingiva that's occurred. Now, I did a vertical graft here of about 7 to 10 millimeters vertical. And if you want to see this, you can go to our website. The video is on our website on the implantacademy.co.za. You can visit and see our, see our videos. And um, that shows you the bone grafting technique. And here you can see how we're creating. Now, one of the key factors here is that we are creating uh, the incisions go at least one centimeter up into the vestibule. Here we are using a rotating, a rotating blade, which is a blade, a, a special type of... Uh, blade holder that I get from uh, Ustamed. And um, this really, really works well. You can use bendable blades as well, but they're far more expensive. And this is really a great way to, uh, to work with this and allows you to really uh, work at angles and really gets you into the, the, to do this technique very well. And I would urge anyone who wants to do this to get hold of Ustamed and get, uh, get, uh, get this type of uh, blade holder because it really allows you to get into and work with this case. So here you can see, now we go to, we change to a, to a straight blade. And again, this is all a split thickness flap. So we are splitting the flap completely. And you can see how deeply we are going in to the flap. And we still haven't exposed the implant. So the implant is still, so this is a split thickness flap. There you can see just this, one of the screws that we use for the vertical graft that was a puri a Puri tunnel technique that we did here to get the vertical graft, taking out the screw. 
and making sure that everything's in the right position so that we've got everything in a very, very nice workflow. We now expose the implant. We just make little cuts over the, over the top of the, uh, the screw, over the healing, over the cover screw. Taking out the, uh, the abutment, taking out the, the uh, checking that there's no bone that's going to uh, get in our way. So we just correct away any bone, check to see that, the, that there's no bone in that in, that's grown over the top. Use our smart peg, making sure that we've got integration. And you can see here with this that we've got really phenomenal integration in grafted bone. We've got an ISQ level of 79, which is really fantastic. And here you can see placing everything into position. A cover screw. Here we don't really go for, uh, for bridges. You can put a temporary bridge in if you want to, um, but we put, just put cover screws in and leave that. And now you can see how important the suturing is going to be because this is the key factor, is how we suture this flap. Now again, I am not trying to close my flap to the palatal portion. I'm going to leave this entire area exposed to the environment. Now the first question that people ask is, well, isn't that painful for the patient? And the answer is absolutely not. The patients feel absolutely nothing. So what we can do is we put this in, we get everything into position, we suture everything closed. Now all of these sutures, what's important about these sutures is that they are all uh, periosteal sutures so that when you put pressure on the flap, there is no mobility of that flap. And that way you can make sure that that whole piece of keratinized tissue is also non-mobile keratinized tissue. And it's very, very important. So here we just do simple interrupted sutures. And these are special sutures that we do that we'll teach in, in, in hands-on wherever we meet you around the world. I haven't got time now to go through the exact suturing techniques, but you can see here what we do again, periosteal sutures, very, very important is understanding how to do a periosteal suture, understanding how we utilize periosteal sutures with all of these flaps. And it's just as important when we're doing our vestibular plasty to make sure that we develop these tissues as well as possible and make sure that we get everything as perfect as possible. Again, not pulling the flaps together, suturing everything in place. Multiple sutures, making sure you can still see there's mobility. How many sutures do I need? I need enough sutures so that the flap is not mobile. Once I've finished the top, this is a very, very important suture that I'm going to do at the top. And this is going to also catch the periosteum. And this suture takes any risk of the flap being pulled by the, when the patient is chewing or eating or talking. So that is a very, very important suture. And you can see with everything in position. And once everything's healed and the, the, the dentist can now go and do the restorative work, you can now see that putting some pressure with ovate pontix, you can see the type of tissue that gets developed as a result of this. And you can see in the one area where we didn't do, this was just an immediate implant where we didn't develop the tissue, compared to the area where we developed the tissue, look at the difference in the expansion that's taken place. That's why I use this case, because it's such a good uh, example of what we achieved. We get minimal papilla ingrowth, so you must understand that when we have these vast areas, we are only going to get pseudo papilla. You are not going to get papilla infill, and that's where you can use some pink porcelain or long contacts to try and get a good result. But if you look at the emergence profile of this crown, when you look at it down or side on, you get a really incredible uh, type of uh, tissue in that area. So that's dealing with the top jaw. And the great thing about the top jaw is the top jaw has got plenty of attached gingiva and keratinized tissue in the palate. But what about the lower jaw? Can we, can we utilize this technique in the lower jaw? And the answer is definitively, yes, we can. We can utilize this very, very well. And here you can see with this technique, you can see more often than not, we end up with very, very small bands of attached gingiva. And what I like to do with these cases is I like to do exactly the same thing is split the tissue and apically reposition that tissue. And by apically repositioning that tissue and by leaving the space that we have here, it allows us to develop a large band of attached gingiva. And it means that we don't have to go in and do a second 
surgical procedure, like a free gingival graft with vestibular plasty, which is what I'm going to show you next. And often we do our patients a huge favor by just taking the time and using R2 gate, using guided surgery also, when we're doing our placement, these are the type of flaps that we should be uh, working with to make sure that we can rather develop our tissues first off to allow us to get a much better result. Here you can see another case in the lower jaw, classic type of scenario where we did an exposure, we exposed the, the, we exposed the implants uh, in, in the area. Obviously we had the uh, mental nerve, so we couldn't go as far as we wanted to. We had to, we had to overlap a little bit and that's why we got this little bit of infold. But most importantly is look at how much tissue that we've achieved. We've achieved massive amounts of tissue without having to worry about getting, uh, about getting um, a piece of tissue from the palate. So we really saved the patient a lot of time, a lot of pain, and a lot of uh, treatment. And you can see here, again, you can see the beautiful band of attached gingiva around this area, and we now have produced stable soft tissue, thick soft tissue, that's now going to withstand the test of time and allow our implants to stay healthy over the long term. When we're looking at full arch cases, again, we can do the same thing in full arch cases. And here you can see how we took. Now, this takes a lot of time. This is around 45 minutes just for me to do this split thickness flap and to apically reposition it. I can also reduce my tissue. But the key factor is, is after two months, look at the type of tissue that I've created from almost nothing. From nothing, we've created nice thick band of attached gingiva that we don't have to go back and do an attached gingiva or a free gingival graft. And what I tell my patients with these type of situations is that in a situation like this, I'm going to try and do an apically reposition flap. If I manage, I'm going to save you both money and, and time and an extra surgery. But if I don't manage, if your body doesn't accept and get and heal the way I want to, I'm gonna to have to do a free gingival graft at a later stage. And often if I get a good result, I really have a very happy patient because I've saved them so much time and so much effort to get to where we wanna go. So let's look now at the, let's look at the vestibuloplasty. And if we look at this, uh, at this, um, at this publication, the comparison of two techniques. So now we're talking about when we do a vestibuloplasty, do we need to place a piece of connective tissue? Do we need to place a free gingival graft around there at the same time? Or is it enough that we just do a vestibuloplasty? Because people say, well, why do I need to do it? Or can I just use a, 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 a allograft, uh, some stuff? And, and there's certainly some studies that show that allograft works as well. But I find that allograft doesn't give me as thick a band of attached gingiva. And I tend to get a lot of shrinkage using allograft. Allo, allo, allo graft materials than using um, uh, the patient's own gingiva. But it certainly shows from this thing that says the application of free gingival graft is a more predictable method for enhancing the width of attached mucosa in the vicinity of implants compared with just classic vestibuloplasty. So if we have a look at this case, here you can see I placed these implants, the patient went away, I hadn't developed, I hadn't developed the tissue, and you can see before I've even started, you can see how unbelievable the perimucositis is. Now I haven't lost bone, but if I think now that just with this, I'm just gonna put, uh, I'm just gonna put uh, my, my bridge on or my uh, whatever, I, whatever I put on here and that everything's gonna heal up and be perfect, that's not the case. In fact, it's only gonna get worse. And you can see here that the patient hasn't touched these with a brush either. You can see how dirty they are. So what we did with this is that we rather, we came back and we did a, vestibuloplasty, and you can see it's exactly the same as we did with the, uh, with the um, apically repositioned flap. But now we have to take a piece of tissue from the palate and we have to graft it into position. And you can see the securing. So it's almost the same as an as a apically repositioned flap. The difference is, is that we've just, we've just taken a free gingival graft. And the one thing that's always important to warn the patient is that when they look at it, you can see a lot of times you get some superficial sloughing and often the patient's going to phone and say, hey doctor, there's something wrong. I can see the whole thing's gone white. And often when they phone and tell you it's gone white, it makes you quite scared and, you, and you, it's a little bit worrying because you think that the whole thing's died. So the first thing that I ask my patient is I ask them, uh, number one is, have you got, uh, does it smell? 
Um, if it smells, then often that means that the graft is dying. And if it hasn't, if it doesn't smell, it means that everything's okay. And it's just a superficial slough that's, that's happened there. And you can see at the end when we get the beautiful healing and the beautiful amount of attached uh, tissue that we have. And if you look at the same case four years post-op, and some people will say we have no keratinized tissue on the lingual side, and what I would do in this case is because I have no inflammation and because I have no muscle pull in that area, I'm not too worried about it. But if I do get inflammation and I do get muscle pull, what I will do is I will take this off and I will just simply apically reposition that portion over to the lingual side and then get exactly the same type of tissue on the lingual side. And that's how I would deal with those kind of cases. Here you can see first stage. So what we did is we, were, we knew we were going to do uh, uh, some, uh, some uh, we had uh, done some implants. We placed the implants over here. So before we even started, we knew we needed some. We knew we couldn't split the flap as well as we wanted to. So we put a piece of uh, um, keratinized tissue. You can see what the tissue looks like in that area. And then what we do is when we expose, we apically reposition that tissue again. And you can see the beautiful band of tissue that we achieve here. And you can see there how nicely the palate heals from here using PRF. And for anyone who uses PRF, uh, Rick Miron shows a fantastic, has some fantastic books on PRF, which I've had the uh, opportunity to, to write some, uh, some, uh, some uh, chapters for. And here you can see how beautiful the tissue is in that area. So very, very important to develop the tissues well in that area and also allowing area to clean, we allowing area to clean space so that we can get under and clean very, very well. So what about fixing some of the cases? And this is Zucchelli's uh, modified uh, surgical approach. Um, he shows that when you, have, uh, when you have some recession and you have some, uh, some uh, uh, problems like that, you can actually uh, correct those defects quite well. And from the World Workshop, we know that one of the factors associated with uh, recession and peri-implant tissue is malpositioning of implants, which is one of the key, lack of buccal bone, thin soft tissue, lack of keratinized tissue, and as well as the status of the adjacent teeth, of the attached gum, and surgical trauma. So all these factors are going to lead to recession. So the problem generally with these kind of cases is where we have a lack of buccal bone, or where we've over contoured the crown, or where we have buccally placed implants. How do we manage these cases? How do we actually come back and fix these cases? Now, when I have a crown that I can take off, and this is a provisional crown that was over contoured, and the implant was pushed too buccally, here I generally go for a tunnel technique as described in the first case, because it's easy to take the crown off. You can also very, very simply modify the crown you can kind of create you can take away some of the crown and that's the key don't leave the crown over contoured you have to under contour the crown so that you can pull the tissue back and that allows you to then put everything back in place and once you've got everything back in place it allows you to suture and coronally reposition the flap nicely into position and here you can see the provisionally in place we've now got much better soft tissue profile We've got a much better soft tissue contour, and now the patient can go and have a new final crown placed in that area. Coming back to finish off, um, to finish off uh, this section, you can see here, this is the case I showed you where we had the area where we had soft tissue and I hadn't developed the soft tissue. Now, the difference here is that in a situation like this, what I utilize when we have a cemented crown that I cannot get off and I need to work around there, it is very difficult to get my scalpel into that area and to do a split thickness flap. So the technique of choice is a technique called the VISTA technique, which is the vestibular incision subepithelial tunnel approach, which is quite a long word, which was developed by Professor Homer Zadeh from the University of Southern California, and really a brilliant technique that I use very, very often. And what we do is we create a single incision and we create a pouch from the inside all the way along. And you can actually see that it allows us as well to coronally reposition the flaps there and there, place our piece of connective tissue, coronally reposition, 
and you can see the final result here with coronal repositioning. We've now managed to achieve a beautiful profile. You can see that we've now got the tissue thickness, which has led to now we've hidden the metal uh, underneath. So you now have more than two millimeters, which we know from the earlier uh, publication that I showed you will allow you to get that nice tissue thickness that we have. We've also managed to bring the tissue down coronally so that we also have a better uh, gingival line, which from an aesthetic point of view from a crown will give us a much better aesthetic result. So let's have a look here at, uh, I think one of the last cases for tonight is where we had this, uh, this patient arrived and she had this malpositioned uh, implant where we had to now, we couldn't, she had had three uh, grafts already, tunnel techniques, vista techniques from, uh, from other periodontists and it hadn't worked. So they asked me now to take out the implant and start again. And this patient was very, was very, very teary. And I'll just go through quickly because I don't want to show her face. But you can see when, when everything was exposed, you can see that there's absolutely no uh, tissue on, in this area. And as a result of that, um, the implant was taken out. We removed the implant and we decided that we'd start again. So utilizing, uh, utilizing uh, the removal kits, and we've got the 911 kit from Megagen as well. This was before the 911 kit came out, but it's a similar kit uh, that we can use to, to remove implants. And here you can see the bone defect that we were dealt with. It's quite a severe vertical and horizontal defect. So what we did with this case is we did a curry technique. We developed the bone. We created a mass amount of bone in the area utilizing two curry plates and we deal with the bone grafting. And again, if you want to learn these techniques, come, we do them with the Minic group. We do them at the Academy, join us and uh, come and watch the videos on our website, on our Facebook and on our Instagram pages. So you can see we pack the bone into the area. We use a uh, rotated palatal flap to cover up the area. So we really all in one develop a massive amount of tissue. And here you can see, now we've developed, you can see how much tissue that we have in this area. And you can actually see that even with all the grafting that I've, do, that I've done, I don't need to do further grafting because I have so much tissue. But you can see number one, we've got nice papilla. Okay, we've got everything in the right position. We place our implant in position. There's the implant placed in the correct three dimensional position. The implant goes in. We do a little bit of uh, plasty of the tissue on the, on the top there just to take away the active frenum. And there you can see with final tissue healing, you can see how beautiful the soft tissue healing and now the provisional crown is placed and the final crown is placed to now get a decent profile over time. I haven't seen her for a while, but um, I would like to see her because I think those papilla will probably have filled in by now. Um, we've lost a little bit of tissue on, on the adjacent and that's unfortunate, but definitely with a type of uh, uh, restoration that we had in the beginning and the defects that we had, we were always, uh, we, were, we were never going to be perfect. But if you have a look at the results, at least now we've got gingival levels at the same line and we have a very happy patient as a result of the fact that we took time to develop our tissues in the right way, develop our everything the way we could and take it from case on the left to the case on the right, before and after, and a very happy patient. To finish off this lecture for tonight, and we're a few minutes over our hour, our hour time schedule, you can see here with peri-implantitis treatment, we don't do soft tissue grafting at the same time, and we don't do sub-epithelial connective tissue grafts when we do these cases. We open up these cases and we, de, we, de, uh, we, we clean off the implant surfaces, especially when they're very, very rough surfaces. We clean them off because I find using all the other techniques, I don't really get a, a, as good a result. So I like to use implantoplasty. I use laser technology using the water layers. Um, we use tetracycline. We detoxify with the... Uh, with Profijets as well. Obviously these days we're not using Profijet because it creates so much aerosol and with the COVID virus, it's obviously something that we, we tend to stay away from. So we let that heal, we close up and we let that heal. And once we've let that heal, then we come back once we've got a healed site and we place a, we do a vestibuloplasty with free gingival grafting. And this is what's going to help to maintain the case over the long term. And it's a really, really critical uh, thing for us to do at this stage and it really allows us to now develop and you can see how beautiful that area is healing very very well in that in that whole area so 
the take home from this, and, and it's only an hour, there's not enough time. This is usually an entire day's course that we take you through and we teach you these techniques, but just to give you kind of a little bit of an idea. And the take home from this that I want you to look at is I want you to develop your bone properly. Utilize techniques that work. Utilize techniques that give you bone predictably and reproducibly. Develop your soft tissue properly because once you've done the bone, it doesn't mean that your job is done. Often what happens is we go for minimalistic approach and we just fall at the last hurdle because we've gone for more minimalistic approaches. And minimalistic works well if the minimalistic approach gives you just as successful a treatment as the non-minimalistic. Okay, so it's very important to develop that. Learn multiple different techniques from multiple different masters. In other words, go and learn from different people. Take away and master the different techniques that they teach you because each person has a different skill set and a different idea on how to do things. And sometimes one thing works for you and the other thing doesn't work for you. So develop your skill set, develop the different techniques that you do and become a master utilizing all those different techniques yourself. And you will then just become a better surgeon. And the person that's going to benefit the most is going to be your patient. So if you're unable to do any of these types of treatment, the best idea for you is to refer the case to somebody who can. And there's always somebody who can. But the best thing is, is learn them yourself. And with that, I say thank you very much for listening. I say thank you very much to everyone around the world. Uh, I want to say especially thank you to Megagen. I want to say especially thank you to Minek. It is a pleasure and an honor to be part of your family. I love my family. I love being with Megagen. And um, I just want to say thank you. Thank you again. And uh, a message of, uh, for, the, for the time of the lockdown and, and this dangerous time that we're living in. Please stay safe. Social distance. Wear your correct, uh, your correct PPEs, uh, your, your masks, your gowns, etc. Treat your patients reduce your aerosol, do everything that you can to minimize the risk for yourself and your patients during this dangerous time. We will come out of it and we will have a conference again soon. And I look forward to seeing all of you and meeting all of you at one of these conferences in the very near future. Linda, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Gluckman, for a really absolutely outstanding presentation. Um, as I see, we received several questions from the audience. Basically, all of the questions are from Matt Phillips and maybe he's your mate. So <laughs> you can go directly to the Q&A session and see all of his, uh, his questions or comments because as I can see, they're not only the comments, but also by other, other things to, that I think you are related with. So basically, the first question is about in all of these cases, there were no, no issues with the facial keratinized tissue. What do you do when you are missing both and what's the volume upon exposure? Um, I think I'm not, quite, I'm not sure I understand. So, so in essence, we didn't have enough keratinized tissue. I think in all the cases we didn't, in some of the cases we didn't have keratinized tissue. And um, when I don't have keratinized tissue on the, on, on, the, on the buckle, then I will do apical reposition flaps in the upper jaw if I'm doing exposure. Um, if I haven't got them, then, then I will do a vestibuloplasty and free gingival graft at the same time in the upper jaw as well. But obviously that only gets done if it's a not if it's an if it's a non-aesthetic case. If it's an it's a single tooth, I'll generally go for sub-epithelial connective tissue grafts, pouch techniques and things like that. So it really depends on are you talking about a single tooth? Are you talking about a multiple tooth? Are you talking about you know it's difficult to, to answer a question because it's a little bit vague. But if I don't have attached gingiva, whatever I do, I will build attached gingiva. If it's multiple teeth and it's a... Uh, yeah. Hello, Sean. Nice to see you. <laughs> uh, if, it's, uh, if, it's, uh, if it's multiple teeth, I will generally go for a vestibuloplasty and a free gingival graft. Will I develop thickened tissue? Generally not, because a vestibuloplasty and free gingival graft tends to shrink and it tends to, uh, the color's not great. If, it's, uh, if, if not, then I will, if, if it's a single case, then I will go for connective tissue grafts with, uh, with uh, tunnel techniques, and that will give me both the volume and the and the texture that I require. Okay, and also the second one is, did you try Curie's mm, bone plate technique with alloplates? What about your experience? Do you have it or? 
Um, I was very lucky in the beginning to, to work a lot with Botus when they first brought out their, their allograft plates. And um, I must say it's technique sensitive and it works very, very well. Um, the, the, there's lots of different techniques that work extremely well, um, different to Puri. Um, one of the things that you must understand is that, okay, this is not a bone grafting lecture, but we can talk about bone grafting here a little bit, is that when, what, what we're trying to achieve is graft stability and space maintenance for our graft. So if you get any type of material that's going to give you graft stability and space maintenance, it's generally going to work quite well. What I did find though is that you have to use allograft with allograft plates and you have to use a membrane. And the other problem with the material for me is that you also need to wait between nine and 12 months for good bone to form. And if, you, if that's what you want to use, yes, it works well because often we wait with all of the allografts and all of the xenografts and all of the synthetics, we generally have to wait between nine and 12 months to get really good graft quality and graft volume. I use curry because I wait four months and I, I like to finish my cases fairly quickly and I have much higher success rate using that. So I'm just used to using it, but there are lots of different techniques and yes, uh, allograft plates work well, but there is a learning curve and the learning curve is quite steep. Next okay, question. Sean. There's a last question from Dr. Amit Wad Tawan. Which technique do you recommend to expose, expose implants in the lower anterior? Expose implants. Well, I think, you know, just again, I think the, I showed it clearly on, on, on the, in the, the cases that I showed, you know, where I did the lower jaw, the lower jaw implants. Um, it depends on how much attached gingiva there is. You know, if you don't have attached gingiva, then I'll do apical reposition as my first choice uh, to try and stimulate and try and get some uh, attached gingiva. There, we don't often need to worry too much about getting thick tissue and bulk and stuff like that because you don't have patients walking around like this showing off the implant. It's not an aesthetic zone. There, we want function. We want solid tissue. We want attached tissue. So that's, that's where that is key. And um, I think it's important, uh, I think it's important uh, to, to know that. So from that point of view, um, I would do apical reposition would be my first choice. But again, if it's a single site, if it's a molar and I've got tissue, I'd, some, and there's enough keratinized tissue, I just do a simple mid crystal incision and move my tissue buckle and lateral and put my healing abutment in and do two sutures, mesial and distal and close up, and that's absolutely perfect. So it really depends on what you are dealing with. It's, it's difficult in a short lecture like this to explain every scenario because there are so many scenarios. Yep. And I think that's the key is you have to, each scenario, each scenario has a technique that would work best in that scenario. You need to learn them all. Never stop learning. Never stop learning. Okay, so I just want to say, um, everyone who's still with us, thank you very much for joining. This is the last webinar in our series, and I think we couldn't have finished better than this. It's been fantastic, Howard. I really enjoyed a lot. I like your new hairstyle and everything. Looks like you haven't got the hairdressing problems in South Africa. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, I recommend everybody to keep an eye on the education programs that's around. I know Howard's been working like a dog for the last two weeks, months. I don't remember even how long. It's nonstop, totally getting so much stuff online. And no, words can't thank the guys that have helped us with putting this series together. We've had some fabulous speakers. I think we finish in glory with you, Howard. Um, I'm sure we will continue our next series in June. And I hope that we can do some nice education apart from the online in Cape Town with you sometime soon, Howard. It's been great. Thank you so much. Always, 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 always. And Take a look at the guys. chat, Howard, oh, because you always. thank you to you on there. Thank you. And thanks to you guys always, Sean, and to Dr. Park for all your support through the mm -hmm. years. It's, all, it's a pleasure. And, and uh, I didn't know you were there, and I meant what I said about my family. And really, it's cool. So nice <laughs> to have seen you there, even with your Same. cross thank background. You. <laughs> thank you, Howard. <laughs> It's been great. So, Thanks, everyone. Cheerio, everybody. Thank you, Rolandas, for managing. My pleasure. My pleasure. Yeah. Thank you, guys. So, stay safe, stay at home, and see you soon. Bye, bye, bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you, Howard. Thank you.